Good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, as you know from the uh, poster, I'm Arlene Torres. I'm an associate professor in Africana, Puerto Rican, and Latino studies. And I've been here, I guess this begins my second year here at CUNY after having spent a considerable amount of time at uh, the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And uh, Centro has been so kind as to offer me uh, office space and collegiality and a great deal of uh, friendship with the colleagues who are here in my role as director of the Latino Faculty Initiative. Uh, and in the time that uh, I am here, in addition to my administrative duties, I have um, delved into the archive downstairs and found uh, a series of documents that help me rethink uh, some directions that I want to take with respect to my own uh, scholarly research. And that's what I'm going to be presenting on today. I want you to be aware that this is preliminary. Um, as they say in Spanish, hay mucha tela para cortar. And when I started the project, it started as something very small and is now getting larger and larger and larger. <laughs> and so what I'm going to present to you today is just a piece of what is a much larger project. Okay, drawing upon the work of James Holston on questions of citizenship and belonging in the Brazilian context, I want us to consider if as residents, are we willing to, and I quote Holston, legitimate the agenda of rights and participatory practices on the basis of migrant or immigrant contributions to the city, to the town itself, or to the nation, end quote. What form will such an agenda take? And what does race or do racial constructs have to do with it? What happens when folks who are defined as non-belongers come to inhabit the spaces that we call home? And by extension, how does this inform community formation? And this is kind of the big uh, sets of questions that I'm interested in. But for the purposes of today, I'm going to focus on some much smaller issues. In the 1950s, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and Langston Hughes made the following observations. Du Bois said, and I quote, this newest South turning back on its slave past believe its present and future prosperity can be built on the poverty and ignorance of its disenfranchised lowest masses. And these low paid workers now include not only Negroes, but Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, and the unskilled, unorganized whites. Progress by means of this poverty is the present creed of the South. And in the kind of research that I'm currently engaged in, what I'm trying to ascertain is to what extent in the 21st century is this still the present creed of the South. Langston Hughes observed that perceptions about foreignness, race, color, status and language impacted the access that individuals had to employment and social opportunities in the U.S. racial landscape. And I quote, when the Waldorf Astoria first opened in New York, Negroes were not served in its main dining rooms. In a spirit of fun, a well-known Harlem journalist of definitely colored cast put on a <coughs> turban and went into the hotel. He was served with the utmost courtesy. During the war, a fine Negro chemist, quite brown skin, applied for a position in a war plant and was given a blank to fill out. He truthfully put down his nationality as American, his race as Negro. He received a letter saying no openings were available in spite of the fact that every day the firm advertised for chemists. He simply procured another blank. Instead of putting down Negro as his race, he wrote Puerto Rican and was hired at once. Silly are white folks, end quote. 
These excerpts, I would argue, inform some of the complex issues we faced in the 20th century and are still grappling with in the 21st century as race is differentially ascribed to members of ethnic groups. Lauren Thomas's critical work on Puerto Rican citizens in the 20th century also sets the stage for this work. Therein, I examine how Thomas's scholarship contributes to our understanding of the construction of a racialized identity. The arguments in this work, though, will be made the subject of a talk and a panel that is scheduled for the 23rd of March. And I really want to encourage you to attend and listen to this fine work. A conundrum we face as scholars is how to engage with racial categories that are at once fixed and floating signifiers. Categories, as you know, are informed by history, by a sociocultural milieu that crosses national boundaries and imaginaries, and a politics that includes the formation of governmental institutions that is embodied in possibilities and limitations of social actors. This includes, for example, the Bureau of the Census and the Office of Employment and Identification, two institutional frameworks that categorized and racially marked Puerto Ricans. Additionally, even as we focus on racial categories, we must contend with the multiple dimensions of subject formation. Certainly, theoretical and methodological approaches <coughs> to intersectionality have yielded new insights but as Gladys Jimenez Munoz aptly reminds us, as with most social science inquiry on Puerto Ricans, issues of race within women's history are usually relegated to race relations theory, especially between Puerto Ricans and North Americans. This is a marked contrast with the immense concern with social class in Puerto Rican sociohistorical inquiry in the past three decades. Such emphases and oversights mirror the close attention paid to linking race and social class while omitting gender in the social science literature on Puerto Ricans corresponding to the period from the 1940s to the 1960s." End quote. While Jimenez Munoz focuses on the interwar period in Puerto Rico, I would argue that a similar argument might be made with respect to the social science literature on Puerto Ricans in the U.S. in the same period. This raises a host of questions about the archive, the use of mixed methodologies, and interpretations that can potentially yield new understandings and areas for future inquiry. My overall objective is to begin, and I want to underscore begin, to contextualize how Puerto Rican cases might help us to understand contemporary processes of racialization among other Latino groups settling in the U.S. as part of a larger project that seeks to explore the relationship between migration, settlement, and residential segregation, race, and gender. I argue that these patterns are informed by racial categories, processes of racialization, and identity. And by doing so, I seek to interrogate what we mean by an ideology of blancamiento or an ideology of whitening. How is this potentially deployed by Puerto Ricans to distance themselves from their darker skinned counterparts? And related to this, what were the possibilities and limitations afforded to Afro Puerto Ricanos in light of the strategies employed by their lighter skinned counterparts, bearing in mind Du Bois's understanding of double consciousness, the co-construction of identities, and the possibilities that derive from that consciousness. For the purposes of this evening, I selectively place published works, archival material, and ethnographic research in dialogue to address some of the aforementioned concerns. Let me begin with the account of someone who many of you know of the Latino, the Afro-Latino family portrait of Gabriel Haslip Viera, penned in the recent volume edited by Miriam Jimenez and Juan Flores in the Afro-Latin Reader. The account powerfully demonstrates how the shifting nature of ethno-racial categories is informed by the cultural prescripts and the social environment. Haslip Viera cogently argues that census enumerators inconsistently applied the one-drop rule, 
to persons of African descent, allowing for somewhat fluid forms of identification, officially and unofficially. This assertion prompted me to consider Lauren Thomas's analysis of the Puerto Rican Diaspora Identification and Documentation Program. And for those of you who are not familiar with the program, during the years of 1930 through 1959, the Bureau of Employment and Identification and the Migration Division of the Labor Department of Puerto Rico issued English identification cards. And although the ID cards were not mandatory, they were extremely valuable for providing American citizenship and easing the way for migrants. Now before I turn my attention to these documents and to Thomas's insights, Hasli Viera's work needs to be further contextualized. Gabriel Hasli Viera's paternal grandfather uh, photographed here, Nicolás, came from Curacao. His maternal grandmother, Merida Peña, came from the municipality of Guayama, located in the southeastern coast of Puerto Rico. Nicolás Gabriel would have been racially categorized in the Puerto Rican context and in Puerto Rican parlance as jabao in some contexts and blanco in others. By contrast, his wife, Merida Peña, was designated as mulata in the Caribbean context and colored in the early to mid 20th century in the US racial taxonomy. The 1910 census carried out in Puerto Rico categorized the couple as negro. Upon the establishment of their residence in Brooklyn, he was listed as having black skin, but shortly thereafter, his World War, II, World War I excuse me, draft card listed him as white. The 1930 census also designated Nicolás as white, but then his World War II draft card described him as dark. Proximate and extended family members were also differentially categorized, and these patterns persisted as the second generation of the Hasli Viera paternal family settled in various locales, participated in the military, and established themselves socioeconomically as part of a broader African American and Puerto Rican a set of communities in the US. Similar forms of identification reflected the ambiguous and shifting nature of racial categories used to designate the maternal side of the family. In 1910, Merida Peña was designated along with other family members as Negro in spite of ranges in phenotype that varied uh, and variations of café con leche the 1930 census classified then the family as white. Hasli Viera notes that in the 1940s, his family lived in the East River houses that included, and I quote, families of mostly Italian and Irish background, some African Americans, and only four Puerto Rican families, including his. Of note was that the families moved to the Williamsburg section of the Bronx in 1955, whose residents was, were also ethnically mixed. Few were African American, Puerto Rican, or Latino. The author goes on to relate that his father, Jaime, generally spoke of people based on their ethnicity or nationality. African Americans were designated as colored people who were somehow different from Hasli Viera's family in spite of their shared black heritage. In this context, ethnicity supplanted race in spite of the fact that racial categories were present. And I've described some of the racial categories that were used. I would concur with Hasli Viera that this was in keeping with Puerto Rican ethnic group formation in the mid 20th century. The published piece sets the stage, though, for further inquiry. More specifically, given my earlier remarks about intersectionality, how did the women in the Hasli Viera family negotiate racial ascriptions accorded to them and to their families? 
How did this impact their livelihood and their day-to-day -day practices in the multi-ethnic terrain of the East River houses of the 1940s and the Williamsburg section of the Bronx in 1955? Clearly, U.S. colonial relations, complex and inconsistent processes of racial classification, social relationships, intermarriage, and place of residence impacted the racial trajectories of this Haslip Viera family and many other Puerto Rican families. At the juridical level, Lauren Thomas aptly notes, and I quote, most jurists and lawmakers so no uh, saw no need to hide their racist judgments about Puerto Ricans behind their coded language of foreign, foreignness. This was at the turn of the 20th century. Their notions about the mongrel Puerto Rican people and the presumed incapacity for self-government that resulted from their racial deficit was repeated ad nauseum in debates that ensued over granting U.S. citizenship to Puerto Ricans at the turn of the 20th century." End quote. By the 1930s, Puerto Ricans were increasingly being designated as non-white. However, Thomas states, using a variety of strategies that reflected both their diverse ideological positions and details of the local social terrain, um, Puerto Ricans struggled to disaggregate their political identity as U.S. citizens from their racial identity that was more formally being ascribed to during this decade. Via an analysis of a series of accounts published in La Prensa, Thomas provides a window to explore these national tropes, ideologies of mestizaje, and distinctions made by Puerto Rican writers between Negro and Negro, that is, between Black Americans and Puerto Ricanos de color, to distance themselves from their African American counterparts in the U.S. Nevertheless, working class and working poor Puerto Ricans were caught in a web of social relations and broader social milieu in Harlem and elsewhere that concerned itself with the relationships between civil rights and race. And certainly, uh, Schomburg and Jesus Colon are an, uh, a testament to this. Interestingly, the Puerto Rican response to discriminatory pra practices against their compatriots in the labor market did not address the hardening of racial lines via the 1930 census and in institutional practice. Citizenship became the focus. The Office of Employment and Identification helped Puerto Rican migrants obtain identification cards proof of citizenship in their view would facilitate employment prospects for these newcomers. Race, however, creeped in. The application of a certificate of identification included a description of the applicant. More specifically, it included a complexion entry, not unlike that which appeared on the various official and unofficial documents that categorized the Viera Haslip family in Puerto Rico in the 1920s and in the U.S. in the 1930s. In spite of efforts on the part of the OEI to take race out of the mix, by deploying racial signifiers in the complexion slot, Puerto Rican employees darkened their poorer and newly arrived compatriots via this system of classification. Even though a white-black binary was not imposed, class, status, and white privilege was invoked to the extent that the applicants were denied their whiteness. Thomas's analysis of the ID cards issues revealed, and I quote, for applicants who were first labeled white on the ID application, either by their own determination or by that of an identification office employee, white was crossed out by hand or covered or typed with an X and then changed to a different label, fair, light, or more frequently, dark." End quote. In short, by categorizing Puerto Rican newcomers as dark, social distance based on class and perceived status was reinforced. And while it is argued that the darkening representation may have reflected the solidification of racial lines and the adoption of these prescripts by the U 
by the OIE employees, excuse me, this classificatory scheme was also informed by island-based racial categories that were also informed by class, socioeconomic status, and lineage. As I read through Thomas's insightful analysis on the Office of Employment Identification cards, I kept asking myself if gender informed the process by which employees were racially categorized as well. We know that the over num overwhelming number of applicants were men. However, women also applied for ID cards. The OEI employees who filled the complexion slot on the application and issued the ideas IDs, excuse me, were comprised both of men and women, but the employees appear to have been more women than men, who were some of whom were members of La Liga Puerto Riqueña. Does it matter? I think it does. Whether it does or not has yet to be explored, and it may help us make sense of the following, and I quote, how Puerto Ricans themselves of different social strata made sense of their gendered and racialized conditions prior to, during, and after the interwar period, following Jimenez Munoz's earlier uh, call to explore the intersections of identities. And this is something that I want to do as I um, explore these documents. Now, a market shift occurred in the 1940s that highlighted the potential whitening of the Puerto Rican subject. On the one hand, the 1940 census indicated that the population designated as white had increased. However, this is informed by the paucity of categories used and their limited applicability in the Puerto Rican case. And for more on this, I defer you to the excellent work of my colleague, Carlos Vargas Ramos, that addresses the use of racial categories and their implications in the census. On the other hand, Puerto Rican migrants were increasingly identified as light or fair, as opposed to dark, in the OEI documents. Moreover, applicants who were previously designated as dark were lightened when they reapplied for the identification cards. And yet, Thomas reminds us that of the 40,000 ID cards that migrants filled out, only a handful of the card, holder, card holders were classified as white. Victor Sierra was among the applicants who arrived in 1952 and was classified as dark in spite of the propensity to use reference on the lighter end of the complexion continuum to mark the Puerto Rican subject. His kin were defined as blanco on the island, and to their utter dismay, he was darkened upon his arrival on U.S. shores. His experiences, though, were not all that different from Joseph Feliciano, who presented his birth certificate that classified him as Blanco, but was issued an ID that designated him as having dark complexion. Another ID piqued my interest, that belonging to Silverio Lebron. In spite of his arrival in 1949, he did not obtain an ID card until 1959, a decade later. And by then, the Office of Employment Identification ceased to identify applicants on the basis of their complexion. Photographs, place of residence, occupation, and data recorded on the birth certificate, however, could potentially serve as markers of class, status, and non-whiteness in a U.S. context that sought to fur further solidify the color line as white ethnic groups were assured incorporation into the white national imaginary. This is a subject I um, hope to take up in, an, in the not too distant future. <coughs> Building on the Haslip Viera case, how did these overlapping classificatory schemes inform daily life? <coughs> In spite of color and status ascribed to Puerto Rican migrants, did these complex discourses and practices inform or delimit their social practices? In other words, how did Puerto Ricans deploy some of these highly problematic notions of identity to make their way in such a manner that cannot be neatly captured 
as simply embracing an ideology or practice of blanqueamiento, but can, in the words of Hasli Viera, begin to, and I quote, illustrate how individuals and entire families from the Spanish-speaking Caribbean can successfully ignore, obfuscate, or repress their Afro-Latin background through intermarriage, the attainment of economic and professional status, or the acceptance or adoption of a racially undifferentiated Puerto Rican, Hispanic, or Latino identity, end quote. By conducting research on the extended kin networks of the applicants, we might begin to reveal something about a wider field of social relations that can yield deeper insights into the race, class, and gendered experiences of Puerto Rican families and the individuals for whom photographs, IDs, exist, and for those for whom photographs and lives have yet to be recuperated. At present, what we have at our disposal is a historiography of broad strokes and particularities that can help um, answer these questions. Now, I want you to bear in mind that I'm an anthropologist, and so anthropologists do kinship charts. And so permit me to introduce a little bit of kinship here. <laughs> this is a kinship chart, and unfortunately, uh, you can't see this very well, but what I want uh, you just to be aware of is that there are circles, um, equal signs, and triangles. A circle is a woman, an equal sign indicates that she's married to a, a man who's designated as a triangle. Uh, this is, uh, it starts with this couple. These are their children and marriages to their children and then it succeeds down generations. <laughs> Silverio Lebron, remember he was one of the people that was in the IDs, um, was um, among the men who was recruited and served in the US military in World War II. Following the war, and unlike many of his compatriots, Silverio returned to Puerto Rico to find limited employment prospects along with his new bride, Aida. He left for Puerto Rico bound for New York in 1949. The supporting documentation <laughs> that Silverio Lebron submitted to obtain an ID in 1959 included his birth certificate. Therein, the names and the occupation of his parents were recorded. His father, Anacleto Lebron, was a bracero designated in the 1920 census as white and later listed with his wife, Juana Diaz, as a native, quote unquote, from Naguabo, Puerto Rico, a racial category that is obviously unclear. What was to become of the son of this bracero? Upon the entry into the U.S. mainland in the late 1940s, how did overlapping classificatory schemes, family lineage, skin tone, the Second World War, as well as residential and occupational segregation over time, inform his social practices as well as that of his extended kin? And what I'm doing here is I'm asking us to kind of think critically about um, Hasli Viera's narrative and what happened to his family as they negotiated their racial identity and then uh, what is happening in the context of uh, Silverio Lebron and his extended family. Okay, I'm gonna... <clears throat> uh, this is Silverio, Silverio Lebron in 1952 and he would have been classified in his extended family as white based on the census in Puerto Rico as well as uh, the census in the context of the United States. His sister, Irene, married Victor Sierra. And this is Victor Sierra. And Victor Sierra on the IDs was designated as dark. Now if you look at these two gentlemen, they look pretty similar. Um, but uh, clearly, there were two different kinds of identifications applied uh, to these two gentlemen. Uh, the families of these two men lived in a robust Puerto Rican milieu in the Bronx, 
and increasingly so in the context of an extended Puerto Rican family network. And I showed you the, the kinship chart of that extended family network. Silverio, um, as I um, indicated, was the uh, brother of Irene who came uh, to New York in 1951 and then later married Victor Sierra. Uh, this was Irene and uh, Victor's daughter and this is Silverio and Ida's daughter in the Bronx somewhere around what the family could figure out was in about 1957. Um, Silverio and Aida settled in the Bronx and remained there. Irene and Victor, however, separated and later divorced, and she left New York to join siblings who were already beginning to settle outside of the city of New York. One family was still ensconced in a broader Puerto Rican neighborhood of extend and an extended kin network in New York and Puerto Rico and a Puerto Rican household and the other family was beginning to integrate a changing ethnic and racial landscape in New Jersey as newcomers to communities of white ethnics and communities of African Americans while maintaining yet again an extended kin network across state borders maintaining ties to the island and preserving a Puerto Rican cultural unity, again within the context of the household and the family unit. And what you have to bear in mind, and I'm not going to get into all of these details, is what was happening in New York in the 1950s and what was happening to New Jersey in the 1950s and into the 1960s and how these two respective families were negotiating issues having to do with race within these two um, contexts. We need to explore those issues as they relate to how they self-identified and how other people identified them. Irene um, and, uh, and Silverio's sister, Elsevia, had settled with her husband, uh, Don Lolo, and their five children in Newark, New Jersey in the early to mid-1950s. Prior to Elsevia's arrival in 1956, I learned that her husband had already been working for several years as a temporary agricultural labor in Dover, New Jersey. So he had a familiarity with New Jersey and that certainly informed um, the residential move to that area. Elsevia worked at home uh, caring for their five children and her husband once he left the agricultural fields, engaged in labor as a busboy, then dishwasher, and later factory worker, once he settled in Newark. All of the children, uh, and they had five children, married early on to fellow Puerto Rican migrants, and most were able to avail themselves of either a middle school or a high school education, and worked as secretaries, teacher aides, laborers, in local factories. Over time, Doña Eusebia and Don Lolo's adult grandchildren and their spouses were engaged in a series of residential shifts that were informed by urban decay and their own sense of upward mobility in spite of their limited means of a grammar and high school education. Four of the five siblings settled in predominantly white or um, white ethnic or Cuban enclaves in the outskirts of Newark uh, into the late 1960s and early 1970s. And today, Doña Eusebia and all of her adult children and their children live in non-Puerto Rican residential areas in the state of New Jersey. Now let us return for a moment to the Bronx-based family. Silverio and Aida chose to remain in New York given employment opportunities and family networks. Aida's parents and sister had also migrated to New York in the 1950s and settled in the Bronx, among other boroughs in the city. 
their oldest child, Wanda, you see her there as a little girl, after an extended career as a teacher, principal, and administrator in the New York City public school system, moved to Westchester County. Her brother, by contrast, remains in New York City, successfully tending to the deceased in a prosperous funeral home. He is a single parent who relies on his father for child care, and Don Silverio Lebron, now 87, remains in the Bronx, tending to his only granddaughter and attending a senior center on a daily basis, reuniting with his compadres from the neighborhood, men he came to know over several decades as an MTA bus driver. Irene, his sister, believes that Silverio obtained the ID that he applied for back in 1959 in order to seek employment as a New York City bus driver. Earlier, I noted that Irene's marriage to Victor was dissolved uh, early on. And as a single parent, she sought refuge from her family living in Newark. Following her second marriage in the 1950s, she gave birth to three children who were reared initially in a shifting white ethnic enclave that became an African-American enclave in Newark throughout the 1960s, and those are the kids there. Into the 1970s, the family moved out of the city proper into working class communities of white ethnics in Essex County. Irene, her children, their spouses, and offspring, like her sister, all lived in non-Puerto Rican residential areas, and each continues to ma maintain ties to an extended network of Puerto Rican kin. A considerable portion of this extended family network continues to be employed, though, in Newark, in New York, and regularly engages with Puerto Ricans and other Latinos in the workplace. Their interaction, though, with white ethnics and African Americans is also informed by their residential patterns. What I want to point out here is that on the one hand, the one family, uh, the family of Silverio and Aida, remained in the Bronx, uh, and then uh, the siblings of Silverio, Irene and Elsevia, left and went uh, to New Jersey having to do with employment pro uh, prospects um, of Elsevia's wife, but in addition also left, uh, Irene left because as a single parent, uh, she chose not to remain in the city but to um, uh, obtain the support of an extended family network. But all of these shifts, all of these residential shifts that I'm talking about uh, between the 1950s and the 1970s, I again want you to critically think about what was happening to these neighborhoods and what were the particularities of this family who were defined in the 1930s as white and then subsequently in the census as white, even though they were Puerto Rican and culturally identified as Puerto Rican, but were able, in a sense, to navigate movement through white ethnic communities in New York and in New Jersey over that time period when uh, white flight was taking place. But there were moments in time when the family was actually living in predominantly African American communities, and so they invoked their Puerto Rican identity in order to create a space for themselves. And then in the context of these other white ethnic communities, they maintained while they still maintain their Puerto Rican identity within the household context and when they traveled to work, they had less of an engagement with the, that broader white ethnic community that they resided in. And so this raises a great deal of questions about the ideology and practice of blancamiento because it wasn't that these individuals necessarily considered themselves to be quote unquote white but the practices that they were in, able to engage in as a result of their skin tone are issues that we need to take into consideration together with issues of class, residential segregation, and so forth. Now thus far, I have taken the time to delineate that shifting residential patterns of this extended family network 
took place. And we have to address, I would argue, the relationship between ethnicity, race, gender, and residence. I want to underscore that we do need to pay attention to re residential segregation and how these families negotiated residential segregation on the basis of how they were perceived and also how they perceived themselves. How did ethnicity, perceived racial categories, inform residential prospects and possibilities for these families? How were strategies for residential and upward mobility also informed by their experiences of race and gender at particular junctures in their daily life in Brooklyn, in the Bronx, in Newark, again in the 1950s through the 1960s and into the 70s? What has shifts in residential patterns, marriage patterns, and the ethnic composition of subsequent generations yielded to the present? Because as I studied the extended family, you will note that addition, um, at the outset, these are all uh, siblings. Uh, this subsequent generation, with the exception of this individual, uh, all married fellow Puerto Ricans. The next generation, oh, excuse me, there's two. This, so they married non-Puerto Ricans. The next generation, four married non-Puerto Ricans. And so the next generation, um, and these are much lighter, these are under the age of 18, and so that's why I put them lighter. It remains to be seen what is going to happen to this generation as we enter the next generation. Are we going to have an increase in the number of um, out marriages? Because at this point, some of these children are, are already Puerto Rican Jewish, Puerto Rican Irish, Puerto Rican Italian, and so forth. But interestingly enough, in this entire uh, set of extended kin, there's no marriage to African Americans. <laughs> These are questions that I'm beginning to explore as I unpack the multiple trajectories of the families that once overlapped in the institutional terrain of citizenship and race making in the Office of Employment um, identification and the kinds of community formations that ensued within and beyond the confines of Puerto Rican New York. This brings me then to a much larger question that informs this undertaking. How did racial constructs, institutional practices, and the exercise of power to use overlapping categories, categories that came from Puerto Rico as well as categories that are used in the US, to delimit possibilities for some and enhance options for other so that those who were designated as darker may have had the possibilities afforded to them delimited by that darker designation. To what extent were these families and individuals acutely aware of the kinds of strategies that were employed to delimit the possibilities and the kinds of strategies they themselves employed to con combat ethnic discrimination and racial segregation via the choices made and the opportunities afforded to them based on their hue, residential patterns, and socioeconomic opportunities. These, I argue, are hard questions because it means that the Puerto Rican community needs to confront race. It's not only about confronting um, issues having to do with hue, but what they did with that hue. What were the implications of this for darker skinned Puerto Ricanos whose lineages are just as complex, if not more, than Hasli Viera? family who availed themselves of some of the opportunities that were afforded to the Lebron families in spite of both of their impoverished socioeconomic conditions when they migrated from Puerto Rico in the first half of the 20th century. Again, I want to underscore that these are hard questions and they have to be asked if possible. We have to ask our kin 
fellow puertorriqueños to reflect on what Gabriel Hasli Viera's observation um, is in these cases, and I again quote him, is to illustrate how individuals and entire families from the Spanish-speaking Caribbean can somewhat successfully ignore, obfuscate, or repress an Afro-Latino background through intermarriage, through the attainment of economic and professional status, or the acceptance or adoption of a racially undifferentiated Puerto Rican, Hispanic, or Latino identity. The future, I would argue, remains to be seen. Thank you. Now, in the interest of honesty, I'd like to extend a special thank you to a number of folks. The archivists and the broader staff at the Centro de Estudios Puerto Riqueños, the library and archives for helping me to obtain some of the primary and secondary documents that I used to begin to develop this much larger work. Carlos Vargas Ramos for his willingness to provide me information every time I head down the hall to ask him a question about the census and for the host of references he's able to recall at a moment's notice. Muchas gracias. And to the scholars that I've named in this paper and whose work I've used, among others that prompted critical thinking about the kinds of theories and mixed methodologies we need to employ if we're going to make sense of this racial madness. I would argue that much of it is hidden in our archives and we need to um, look at it critically um, with an eye uh, to developing scholarship. And finally, I want to thank the Lebron family, whose journeys and shared stories that I have shared with you today and the photographs brought me here today. I want to give thanks in particular to my uncle, Silverio Lebron, you saw there, whose ID I found in the archives. And finally, to my mother, Irene Lebron, who you also saw the photograph there, both of them who now at 87 and at 79 respectively still remember and are still trying to work through these very challenges. Again, thank you. Okay, so now it's time for questions and challenges. And remember this is a work in progress and there's a lot to be done. Um, and like I said, the more I do, the more I think about it, um, possibilities. But I welcome any sorts of questions or concerns or ideas that you might have to help me develop this further. Anybody want to take a stab? Uh, Carlos? Two questions, or one question or a comment. Uh, you mentioned that those engaged in our marriage uh, were to non Puerto Rican, non Latino. Did Correct. I, did anybody, and I suspect that this is also uh, given by the fact that this is happening between the 1960s and 70s when there are fewer non Puerto Rican Latinos, with the exception perhaps of Cubans in West New York and elsewhere in Hudson County. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so in these instances, all these out marriages were with non-Puerto Ricans and non-Latinos. Right. Uh, the comment perhaps is that I, I, I think that this brings out uh, something that I uh, something that we're not always uh, 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 grasping uh, when we analyze the Puerto Rican migration because we tend to go to the larger settlements in the larger communities, which is how it is that uh, there are beachheads or spearheads uh, that start going out. Uh, are they uh, simply those Puerto Ricans that can integrate into uh, non-Hispanic white communities or what have you? And, I, 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 and it comes up because I, I, you know, in, in a policy report that I put out a couple of years ago, I noticed how in communities that are highly Puerto Rican, uh, they're also highly segregated, you know, with segregation indexes of more than 60% at times. Uh, but that when they migrate or sites of new settlement, segregation is much lower, actually is very low. However, between decades, between 1990 and 2000, that segregation increases. So I'm thinking that in, in, in your family, they settled in Newark, 
when it was a, a predominantly Jewish community, I suspect the neighborhood was. Uh, and then as they were leaving and African Americans were settling in that area of Newark, there may have been an in-between migration. They lagged behind the non-Hispanic whites and preceded uh, uh, African Americans, but ultimately they also left. So that there, is, there seems to be a lag in this uh, migration, or like, almost like leapfrogging, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So no, I, I, I think it's and a... that's precisely the process. And so what, what I'm challenging us to do as scholars is to really understand those residential uh, uh, patterns and to look at the residential segregation, but then look at the same time as to what families were doing and how they were negotiating those spaces. And so what I would like to begin to do is to interview uh, family members who participated um, and who lived in those residential, uh, residentially segregated areas, whether they were uh, predominantly white <laughs> ethnic communities or they were predominantly African American communities. Um, there was only kind of, out of this entire extended family, only one family lived in a predominantly Cuban neighborhood. And so what were their experiences? How did they negotiate, in a sense, their, not only their Puerto Rican cultural identity, but no, uh, their, their, in a sense, uh, the racial politics of the time? We don't have enough information as to um, how people were negotiating this between the period of um, I would argue between the period of about the 1950s and 1970s because so much is concerned with, with in a sense, um, a political and civil rights agenda that we're not paying attention to kind of the day-to-day -day, uh, negotiation of that and then what the implications of that were for, for these families and for these individuals. Um, and, and how can we begin to collect those stories, which interestingly enough, as I started to ask questions, are rather painful stories. You probably answered the question because I can blame and I apologize, I was in another way. Um, uh, maybe it has to do with the problem of question, but it just, I want some clarity on this. The, uh, the, the, the Puerto Ricans that classify themselves as white, or were classified uh, as white, did they live in um, white neighborhoods? So they, okay. Not necessarily. And, okay, and the, and the A's and the zeros that are the known Puerto Ricans that I, now I learned that they were uh, white and they were not black. Uh, the Puerto Ricans that marry those, uh, were they light skin? Were they considered light skin? They were considered light skin, but again, you know, in terms of um, in, in terms of kind of Puerto Rican social categories, there was still a range. But but I would say that they thought of themselves as being in the lighter end of the continuum. But what we need to explore is how. Um, in in those marriages and in those relationships and with those children, did those parents and those children uh, develop strategies to deal with uh, the broader uh, communities that they lived in based on mm -hmm. how people perceived them and not just how within the context of the household they perceived themselves. And that gets back to the quote that I started with earlier with the Du Bois and the double consciousness. People that stay in, in the areas that became mixed, you know, the, the, we know all the data about intermarriage and so forth, and they mingle uh, with African Americans, there was, you know, a lot of history about that in, in the East Harlem and Harlem and so forth, uh, and broke the Bronx. And so, so the question of class, I think, plays a big role with this uh, 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 Blancamiento, or you know, which which coincide with the spatial uh, dispersion of, of the of the population. So I like I like your uh, reaction to that. Um. Okay, class uh, certainly needs to be taken into account. But as I commented in the beginning of the paper, was that um, much of the social science literature focuses on the. Puerto Rican experience that focuses on the relationship between race and, and class, uh, 
and less on, on relationships that uh, tease out gender. And I was very deliberate in, in this particular uh, presentation because while some of these individuals came, went to New York first, and they, they didn't go to Harlem. Uh, the, the one, uh, Silverio initially went to, um, to Brooklyn, and, and he went to a multi-ethnic community, and then he went to the Bronx. And then uh, Don Lolo, he was part of the agricultural workers that went to Dover, New Jersey, and then he settled in Newark. But when he settled in Newark, he didn't go to a Puerto Rican enclave in Newark because there really wasn't one at the time that he settled there. He actually, it's quite correct what Carlos is saying, he settled in a Jewish community. Um, over time, the community that Silverio was initially in, in the Bronx, became much more a Puerto Rican community, and he stayed there. But when he started out, he was in a much more um, ethnically diverse community. And so these aren't people that necessarily first came to New York and then went elsewhere. They, um, or that first came to Harlem, let's say, and then went elsewhere. Um, they took multiple paths. If you look at this entire extended family, they went uh, uh, to different places. There was another, another one of the siblings who directly went to Connecticut. Um, and so that's an issue in terms of their initial place of settlement. But over and above that, um, I, I want to underscore here, um, all of these individuals who all ended up uh, coming to the U.S., uh, with the exception of Irene, my mother, none of them had even a high school education. They all worked uh, on sugar plantations, and they were poor, dirt poor. So was it skin color then? Uh, no, I'm not saying, I'm, what I'm arguing is there's a combination of factors at play. We can't just talk about uh, skin color as being the only determining factor because they, it in part helped the, the, uh, the communities that they were able to settle in, but then they had to negotiate all kinds of other things. And to this day, this subsequent generation, this generation right here, the majority of them, they still are, uh, at most, most of them received a high school education. They still work in factories. Most of them still work slightly above minimum wage. So they're still poor. But they were able to amass, in a sense, a degree of resources that allowed for uh, some upward mobility as uh, in terms of the movement from poor to working class. Additionally, I think the issue of the war, service in the war and then being able to kind of move into factories of union labor despite the fact that they didn't have a high level of education afforded them the possibility to buy modest homes. Uh, and so in that sense, there was some upward, there were social factors that also contributed to their upward mobility. But then when you get to uh, this generation, all of these people either have an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, or a doctorate. These are people who valued education. And so that entire ne next generation is highly educated relative to their parents. Um, and, and those individuals, I would argue, are very much members of, of what one could, would consider middle class. I'm wondering uh, if you've asked or what would you make of the question uh, whether or not the classification of identity in Puerto Rico prior to coming here and being categorized either by the Commonwealth or by the island government or within family networks mm -hmm. had more or less of an effect 
for Puerto Ricans coming to New York than the effect of U.S. white classification uh, methods had on them. Because I, in terms of my own family, uh, my sense is that we bring whatever complications or baggage around race with us from Puerto Rico. It's not, wasn't acknowledged, it wasn't something to talk about, mm -hmm. but it's something that had to be li lived with because we were moving into a migration in which Puerto Ricans and African Americans were moving north to places like Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, uh, etc. And there was public housing. And public housing had an effect that I'm not sure uh, whether the people, the families you're talking about, were living in tenements in, in their own homes, apartments, walk ups, or whether they, like I, living in, in the projects where everybody was mixed racially, but all of the same class, economically. They were living in some of the tenements and the public housing and, and then uh, in, in smaller communities, uh, well, in city contexts that were highly impoverished. But bear in mind that those communities at the time that they were migrating were still very much uh, um, multi-ethnic and, and, and poor so that there were Italians, there were Irish living there, there were African Americans, there were Puerto Ricans, Cubans, and so forth. And so by the time that it becomes a predominantly African American and Puerto Rican enclave in, in some of the cities, they had already moved out. Uh, but, but I agree with you that certainly they brought with them the ideas and, and a sense of, of, of being blanco. Um, that came from the ideas that they had in Puerto Rico, even though they were poor and you know they worked on sugar plantations, they were socially classified as blanco. You know they didn't have the status of you know what people pejoratively refer to as blanquitos, but um, they did they did see themselves and imagine themselves to be. Um, blanco. Now, I'm not saying that's the same thing as white in the U.S. context. We have to think about the kind of um, um, linguistic move and cultural move uh, in the shifting meaning of blanco and white. And so I think that they understood that. But at the same time, they were also dealing with how they were being perceived by others in the spaces that they lived and worked in. And we need to explore that. We need to ask those questions. And what I find really interesting is that folks who came here in the 1950s, when you start to broach that subject, they don't want to talk about it. That's kind of taboo. And I'm trying to push the envelope a little bit and ask people, and particularly those who are now getting older, like the family members who are in their late 70s and 80s, to reflect on what their experiences were, and to see what um, what kinds of narratives will come forth about those experiences. And there seems to be much more of a willingness to reflect on that mm -hmm. as they're getting older. Um, so I'm hoping to capture some of that complexity. Mm -hmm. I just want to share with you, this year I had the opportunity to work with the census and you know go into the homes people and that question about you know your race was very interesting to get um, response of people from and one of the things that people were surprised about were was that they had the option to claim more than one so to them that was like oh okay there was this woman who was in her 80s lived in the Bronx her whole life since she was six um, from Puerto Rico, and she was really surprised about that option. She said, you know, we didn't have that option before. And my father said, it's okay to claim white because we're gonna get benefits with that. <laughs> so, you know, that got me to thinking, wow, you know, how many people did that? Just thinking, well, why would you claim anything else and what's gonna give you an advantage? 
Um, and that would just be a make sense kind of thing. But then what about... But then what are the implications the of implications that for a broader uh, Puerto Rican community? Mm -hmm. And then more specifically, given the kind of research that I do, what are the implications of that for a broader Afro-Latino uh, community and possibilities for social uplift and alliances with, okay. with fellow you know, compatriots? Right. And some people even talked about the, the guilt that comes with that because here's your grandmother in the room and you know she's not white. So what does that do to you psychologically? Thank you for your comments. Other questions, comments? One last oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I think I, I appreciate opening some doors for uh, psychological. I think our Puerto Rican community has for many years, as we all know, in La Isla, in the Taos, you know, battled and consciously or unconsciously handled issues of race, I, and don't handle it, and denied race within a family, because uh, as we all know, within one family, you can have different colorings, and across the collective Puerto Rican family. But I do think that we are in a very fortuitous time in terms of having Puerto Rican scholars that can look at and create critical consciousness about our collective racism and about one that I particularly find that is very noxious, the intra-family racism, mm -hmm. okay? So I, I think that this kind of work and others that you know, we talk around about <coughs> help us look at ourselves, you know, take the mirror, el espejo, and look at ourselves and go back to that question that was asked so many years ago, y tu abuela, donde está? And your grandmother, where is she? Mm -hmm. So I think that this contribution, this work of looking at those IDs of the 1950s and you know who was called what, who was designated what, is to help clarify what is our narrative and what is like, the real memory that we want to preserve. You know, and it's not a memory of racism, or it is a memory of what racism has done to us as people, and how we have to redress that. I appreciate your your comments, Elise. I want to make um, a particular plug for those IDs. Lauren Thomas did an absolutely superb job in in the book on on Puerto Rican citizens, and she's going to give this presentation in March related to the work. Um, but um, my challenge is to take, I was at least fortuitous enough to have found two IDs of people that my family knew, and one happened to be a family member, right? And so I was able to trace with the one, with two IDs, all sorts of relationships and understandings about how people were situated. And you have 40,000 of those IDs. Imagine if you just took 100 of them and you could actually then think about, because in there are the birth certificates, the families, the neighborhoods that they came from, where they first lived, and if you could locate some of those people and develop the same kinds of kinships and family lineages and residential shifts in residential patterns, what could that tell us? What could that tell us? I mean, this is just a snippet and with one. And so the power of what's in that archive um, can yield a whole set of untold stories. And so I had the photograph of Silverio Lebron, but you now have the photograph of Irene Lebron and of and of Wilma and of and of Ida and of uh, and of Victor, because I was able to develop uh, that broader archive to understand how that person was situated in terms of class, race, gender, and so forth. And so, think about the power of the one piece. I, I'm just still thinking that. I don't know whether it's class, which is, uh, it seems to be that that's not the, the concern here because you pointed out of their uh, poverty. But I still think that, that something uh, puts them in the, in the position that they could blanquearse, 
And the question I have for you is that the, the fourth generation, if, right, the zero and the eight, if they choose, if they choose, and thinking about what the compañera said in the back, if they choose not to claim the black ancestry, which is in some place here, simply because, as you know, this right. is what I understand, uh, where the Reagan equal mm -hmm. this uh, mm -hmm. ancestry, if they choose not to claim that ancestry, how would you, uh, what would you say about them concerning that identification? If they choose not to choose the African ancestry that is in some place. Mm -hmm. That's very probable because of the social context that they find themselves in and these, uh, the previous generations. But at the same time, uh, we need to take into consideration uh, a whole host of variables in terms of what is happening and what kinds of education they're receiving within the context of the Puerto Rican household, um, that broader extended family, and uh, the broader social interactions that they have in, in, in the world. One, um, and so uh, it worries me. I'm not going to say it doesn't. It worries me. Um, but we do need to pay attention to to all of these different kinds of, of contexts in terms of the, the what is it that they're going to claim. But would they have from from the Puerto Rican perspective, right? I know the uh, white perspective. Let's just put it to you this way. Uh, since they know that they have one draft black in some history, mm -hmm. that sector will not consider them white. But in our case, if they choose, if that group chooses, because all of the context that you have described, where they grew up, uh, who their parents are, and their grandparents who have already classified themselves as white for all kinds of reasons, if they choose, to bring up one kind of ancestry and let go the blackness of the Taino and the other one, how would the Puerto Rican community see them? And I know it's, it's very, I mean, I'm mean, including you, the whole Puerto Rican community, but in, in your case, I guess, how would you? Um, that's a difficult thing to answer because the Puerto Rican community is extremely diverse, right? And so, and has multiple understandings about that. And then it's also very contextual. And so, in they may, for example, um, still quote unquote racially identify as white, but they may still ethnically identify as Puerto Rican and may still embrace the kinds of cultural practices of Puerto Ricanness that also includes practices that are African diasporic. And so, you know, I mean, I did say at the end of it, this is my extended family, and I'm very critical of them at the same time that I love them dearly. Um, but um, one of the ways in which this happens, which is also another way to kind of critically think about this, is that this extended family in spite of the fact that they live in non-residential Puerto Rican and even non-Latino areas, um, the majority of them, they still live in very, what I would argue as an anthropologist, very Puerto Rican households. And then when they get together for family functions and what have you, la Puerto Ricanidad is, is um, is reinscribed and celebrated through through the kinds of familial acts of of eating, of dancing, of listening to music, of language, and so forth. And and, um, and but but again, from an anthropological perspective, I step back and I say, then do we relegate lo negro simply to popular culture and not to kind of a broader critical mm -hmm. understanding of black contributions to the making of 
Puerto Rican society and culture. And those are, those are questions and conversations that have to be asked all the time. I have a friend uh, who is um, doing something interesting, but similar. She's looking at uh, colorism amongst African Americans in the 1940s and 50s. And she was able to get a hold of diaries, letters, particularly love letters, where you see lots of descriptions mm -hmm. uh, in there that are quite rich. And she's also uh, looking at music, you know, local music in terms of description. So I was wondering, um, is that something you also plan to incorporate as part of, of, of this project? Um, I would love to talk to your colleague. <laughs> um, as I said, this is, a, this is an emergent project, and I'm still trying to figure out what are um, the kinds of tools at my, disposal, at my disposal to tease out um, those uh, relationships. Uh, mm -hmm. Just a quick comment. Uh, we have a colleague in the African Puerto Rican Studies Department, uh, Milagros Dennis, who's looking at the whole question of how the notion of race that we embrace here, you know, our second, third generations that have been formed with different racial perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, go back to the island, and if one floors us his theory or argument that, uh, that we go there and promote social change. You know, we promote, uh, uh, we try to adapt then our perspective gained in the, in the United States to the Puerto Rican society, which has a completely different understanding and the clash, you know. Y, y, y cuando los niños son, you know, trieño, negro, then all the problems that come with the school and everything else. So just looking into that, my question to you is, as you see these generations, I don't know if they, if they went back to Puerto Rico, there is a reverse uh, effect from the second generations when they go there. Because as, as, uh, as much as they may deny or not their racial background, the fact is that they've been uh, raised in a completely different uh, context. And, and when they go back, at least my experience, my, you know, it's primo here even my brother, you know, when they go back, they have a completely different understanding and they do have an impact in, 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 in the institutions and, and family circles and friends and so forth. And, and this issue of consciousness that you raise become more apparent as, as, as they return. Mm -hmm. Be, you know, as, I'm sorry, when, the, when they themselves see their skin color as them being discriminated in ways that they would not have felt. I just you know I don't know if you have uh, some of that experience or and and some of that uh, may be uh, certainly was occurring. I think what we need to be cautious though about is to assume that these ideas are simply brought from the U.S. and transported to Puerto Rico, and that in Puerto Rico itself there aren't people already thinking about these issues and more specifically afro puerto Ricanos who um, have been addressing these issues all the way along and then uh, then the, the the in a sense mantra is that um, the new york Ricans are bringing um, ideas about race to the island and we're not really like that and we all know how problematic that is and so, um, so that those kinds of things need to be teased out, and attention also needs to be paid to, in a sense, the um, the emergence uh, and the sustenance of of Afro Puerto Rican movements on the island that have existed for centuries, uh, and then how do those uh, do those individuals interact? And almost it becomes a breath of fresh air as they engage with Puerto Ricanos who are coming to the island with that different sensibility. You know, those are different kinds of issues I think that need need to be addressed. In the context of, of this extended family, um, they were so poor that they did not return to Puerto Rico, uh, most of them until they were um, well into adulthood. <coughs> I think it's, uh, I appreciate your clarifying that because I think it's very dangerous um, for the collective consciousness to think that, you know, from the United States, they're going to go back to Puerto Rico, 
the reality is, and having just been back to the United States myself <laughs> this, one, this past year, in Puerto Rico, as you will know, for the past 30 years, since the late uh, 60s, early 70s, there is and has been a growing literature on black consciousness in the arts, in history, Narciso de Cura, su trasero, stories, literature, and in the past, the thing is it's not well known, but it exists in all kinds of consciousness and raising groups that have, there's a wonderful project, I think you know about it, um, and books that I have brought and, and shared with you, but there's been a project for the last five years for third grade, fourth grade, about raising consciousness about our race. So there are projects in Puerto Rico. The thing is, they're not supported by the government at large. So they're always struggling, you know, community projects, small group projects, women's projects, that, you know, nobody really hears about it, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. And that's why I think it's important to be very careful. But racial consciousness in Puerto Rico doesn't come out to the light that we would like it to, but it has been an ongoing process for the past few years, maybe not at the speed also because there's a thrust against it in Puerto Rico, but there has been a developing consciousness about our African roots, about our ancestors, and, you know, the racism in the island and how colonialism, you know, legitimizes it all the more and the, and the current government. So it's, it's a very complex, but it is important to clarify that I think just as in the United States there was a growing uh, consciousness of racism among the Puerto Rican community here that was raised here in the 60s and 70s, also in Puerto Rico. You know, and there's, there's, there's quite a few, there's literature on different projects, literature that's come out that is very rich. Anybody who's interested, both uh, myself and, and, um, and Arlene can, can give you references. You know, ultimately, one of, you know, a, as a as a scholar, but really as a as a, as a Puerto Rican, and someone who's really interested in and committed to social change and to dealing with structural inequality and social inequality on a daily basis, um, as a scholar, I feel I have a responsibility to take the the knowledge that. I can gain as a researcher from the archive and from interviewing individuals to try and make sense of some of these really thorny, painful issues. But at the same time, it just can't stop there. It also has to be about using this information and figuring out how to develop methodologies, ways of speaking, ways of having documents speak to each other, but ways also of having people speak to each other and work through some of these issues um, and bring them to light and to discuss um, the kinds of difficult choices that that people made and what what informed them rather than say, oh, you know, you define yourself as white for whatever reason and be dismissive of that person and you define yourself as, as black um, and, and be dismissive for whatever reason, but to actually think about those broader contexts and get people to start to engage in the kinds of dialogue to understand the painful social context and, and the things that they gained and the things that they lost that are still being played out at the familial level and at the social level. And that's very real. And in that sense, when people say race is a social construct, I remind them that the implications about what it did to our bodies and to our families and to our relationships is real. And we have to figure out a way to, to deal with it. You had a comment? I just wanted to, to say that the, uh, the title, uh, the Blanqueamiento and, and the immigration and the trek north and its implication, the Afro Latino diaspora, what rings to me as uh, someone who came here in 46 with, and I saw myself and my family in the pictures, is that right now, today, we get the, the data from the Pew Hispanic. Center about Latinos 
in, in the United States in 2009, mm -hmm. and in the next few months, years, we're going to be making important political decisions about uh, redistricting. And the reality of this, uh, besides the familial reality, is the impact on Puerto Rican, Black, Dominican, now Mexican uh, communities interacting with each other, who are, have all made or are making that trek, often for economic reasons, uh, sometimes for personal reasons, whatever, but that the impact is not just on the diaspora, it's on the dynamic and on the dialogue that's needed because there's going to be a struggle, as, as it stated earlier today in a meeting in East Harlem, over the congressional district. The 68th, uh, Charles Rangel, <laughs> black Puerto Rican, uh, Adam Clayton Powell the fourth, black Puerto Rican, mm -hmm. and where the lines will be uh, to either make it more of a black, less of a Latino, and so the the issues of black and Latino community political relationships are at stake along with the individual and so the the ability to unpack the personal story and maybe cut, maybe connect it to some of the more public people in terms of holding people account, accountable about these issues of how la how race is used to oppress and maybe to take advantage and not to create a more perfect union. I agree wholeheartedly. Those kinds of issues need to be handled because we can't just keep it at the familial level. It also has to uh, be in the public realm and then we have to understand the relationship between, like I talked about residential segregation, but then the social institutions that inform those possibilities and the political frameworks and networks. I mean, this is just one piece of what probably will become a very, very large project and what uh, what prompted me to think about some of these issues is a larger project that I'm working on because I'm actually particularly interested right now in what is happening to the Afro-Mexican population that is um, migrating and settling into South Carolina and North Carolina in predominantly African-American um, enclaves and so what have been kind of traditional trailer parks that were um, inhabited by African Americans are now becoming increasingly inhabited by migrants from Mexico, some of which are coming from Veracruz, um, who define themselves as Afro-Mexicano in every imaginable range, and, and then uh, also coming from Guerrero. And most people don't know that there are Afro-Mexicanos. And so what happens in those kinds of spaces when you have Afro-Mexicanos from Guerrero and Veracruz interacting with other Mexicans as well as um, uh, in, uh, indigenous peoples um, who are of, of um, indigenous descent from the lower part of Mexico, all, then interacting with Latinos, however defined, uh, and white ethnics in South and North Carolina, okay? I mean, what, you know, it's extraordinary, you know, what what's happening there, and in terms of just the, the just the sheer misunderstanding about, uh, about race, culture, nationality, because of uh, stereotypes that that all of these groups have in relationship to one another. And, and so in a sense when I started out my quote about talking about the changing South 
you know, using the work of Du Bois and Langston Hughes in terms of how they were thinking about the southern United States. These things are happening in the South, and we're not paying attention to them. Um, and in the same way that they're happening in the South, they're also happening in the communities that you just made reference to. So there's much to be done. I would pay attention to, um, to identity, not just you know, our past identity, how we, how we define our identity to date, but how it's still evolving. Um, saw a quote, to, a post today from my granddaughter on Facebook saying, so-and-so doesn't look Puerto Rican. And then her father responded, well, you have a lot of nerve. And she said, well, nobody thinks I look Puerto Rican either, because she's very dark-skinned. And um, so I wrote back, well, that happens to me all the time, and she thought that was funny. But the reality is that how we see ourselves mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. very important. You know, And every time I travel to Puerto Rico, they stop me and say, where are you from? You know, it's like, excuse me, I mean, yeah. <laughs> don't I look very Puerto Rican? But they don't think so. So how I see them and how they see themselves, right. there seems to be a discrepancy mm -hmm. there. And so what's happening with our community in terms of our own internal identity and how that plays out with our, um, in our relationships with other peoples. So how do we relate to the rest of the Caribbean <coughs> when we think of ourselves as white and they're not? And Latin America is not white either. And, and then how do we affiliate ourselves with communities here in terms of being a united front? And those are all such important questions and things that I think that we need to figure out ways to tease out. In the development of social and political alliances, because ultimately, I would argue that those kinds of social and political alliances are absolutely necessary. Okay, I think that we have had um, a really productive discussion. Um, I welcome, as you reflect on some of these issues, because like I said, this is a work in progress and I'm always kind of trying to figure out how to make sense of the material that I have in front of me. So as you reflect on these issues, I welcome your comments. I really thank you for um, your commitments and for uh, paying attention in the late hour. Um, <laughs> And uh, I look forward to your participation in this process. So again, muchas gracias.